It's time for Agriculture, presented by Tricana Farms in Germantown, New York, a small-scale producer of heritage breed livestock and a wide array of vegetables and berries on just over 39 acres. They also produce a full array of garden vegetables, many of them heirloom varieties raised naturally, as well as an assortment of berries, including raspberries, blackberries, gooseberries, black, red, and white currants, mulberries, and elderberries. And now, here's Mark Scherzer. I'm savoring this Columbus Day weekend as a time of reprieve. Nuclear war has not yet begun. We can continue to live in the hope that perhaps it will not. Maybe the Russians who are threatening it will realize that the consequences for them would be even worse than defeat in their war to annex rich eastern provinces of Ukraine. I hope the Russians like their children, too, said Eric, recalling one of Sting's songs, Russians, that was quite popular in the 80s. It resonates today and echoes that dreary time. The feeling of reprieve derives also from less cataclysmic matters. After predictions earlier in the week of November-like cold for Columbus Day weekend, this part of the Hudson Valley passed the time without frost. Cool and crisp, but lovely. This reprieve, however, we are sure is just temporary. Frost is an axe that we know is going to fall someday. Regardless of it being inevitable, the delay in the frost has been a great source of joy to me. It increases the likelihood that there will be some local second-cut hay on the market this fall, after a summer of drought cut production drastically. It gives my escarole, spinach, beets, and daikon radishes in the garden a fighting chance of getting to decent size this month. It postpones my turning off the outdoor water, allowing me to continue showering in the open air, as I have exclusively done since May. Nevertheless, knowing that the reprieve is not forever, I'm taking the opportunity to anticipate the end of growing season and enlisting whatever help I can get in that process. Old friends Craig and Rosemary from Washington, D.C., on their way to a brief New England vacation, came prepared for the weekend with farm duds. This morning, they picked almost all the remaining quinces, roughly 30 pounds of them. We enjoyed a Turkish lamb and quince stew for dinner last night. Now I will process the newly picked quince into quince paste, quince jam, and some poached quince in syrup as a dessert. Then this afternoon, I enlisted Craig in a long postponed barn project, removing the metal wire mesh we had installed in the manger in a futile attempt to prevent the sheep from pulling large quantities of hay from it onto the barn floor and wasting it. They demolished the flimsy wire fencing, but the twisted remnants were still attached. We had to take those out and install in its place hard metal feeder panels, which the sheep will be unable to take apart so readily. Um, gives me much less trepidation now about keeping the herd fed this winter. While we were doing all this, Eric was engaged in another key end-of-growing-season task, taking care of the bonanza of green tomatoes, which will no longer ripen well on the vine, but which should not go to waste. We put aside those of a certain size for fried green tomatoes, but for the rest, Eric had a clear plan, a traditional Quebecois green tomato ketchup. It's no surprise that the Quebecois should have a great solution for green tomatoes. They have a season with early frost. It closes down early and likely to leave them with a lot of unripe tomatoes. And it's also not such a big surprise that the solution might involve something called ketchup. Canada is the only place I've ever been where you can buy ketchup-flavored potato chips. Now, ketchup has a venerable history. Many sources agree that the name derives from East or South Asia either a Chinese or Malay word, or the name of a specific concoction called ketchup from the island of Amoy, combining soy sauce and fish essence. English sailors brought the Asian ketchup home with them in the 17th century, and the English in the next hundred years changed the recipe to include such ingredients as anchovies, lemon, shallots, and mushrooms. It's thought that tomatoes first entered the ketchup picture in Nova Scotia in the 18th century. Later, in 1837, a New England farmer, Jonas Yerkes, started bottling tomato ketchup commercially. The Heinz Company followed later and fixed on its contemporary ketchup recipe in 1872. The rest, they say, is history. Ketchup became America's favorite condiment until replaced by salsa in the last couple of decades. 
1981, the Reagan administration's Agriculture Department even proposed counting ketchup as a vegetable and determining whether school lunch programs were meeting their nutritional requirements. And in one of those ironic circularities of history, tomato ketchup, similar to standard North American fare, is now sometimes used in Chinese recipes. And there are, of course, non-tomato ketchups. I myself have experimented in years of particular plenty with cucumber and plum ketchups. The essential feature of ketchup in North American usage is now that it contains vinegar. And so does Eric's green tomato ketchup. The recipe is one which he tells me is very close to his mom's. He's already salted a large quantity of finely chopped green tomato and onion to extract the moisture and add iodine. When he then removes the salt, he'll cook the combination with vinegar, sugar, a combination of whole spices, that's all spice, cloves, cinnamon, bay leaves, and mustard seed all wrapped in cheesecloth, and cook it. He'll then remove the spice packets and can the ketchup. Voila, the productivity of the garden saved from the ravages of the coming frost. I can't wait to taste it. Agriculture is underwritten by Chicana Farms, LLC, a small-scale producer of heritage-bred livestock and a wide array of vegetables and berries on just over 39 acres in Germantown, New York. More information, 518-537-3815.